hopefully you've had some coffee, you've had a snack. Yeah. Dangerous. Oh, awesome. Someone's getting dangerous. <laughs> going fabulous, energized, relaxed. That's good. Good. Hello. Hello. Challenge. Oh. Oh, I see some smiley faces. Oh, that's great. So, so what we'll do is um, when we've got the presentations, you can start, if you've got kind of questions and comments, you can just put them in as we go along. And then at the end of the presentations, Joel will pick them up to ask the presenters. And then same when we've got our panel discussion. Inspired. Oh, you guys are feeling inspired. That's, that's good. And happy. Inspired and happy. I'm going to go with inspired and happy. Okay, so now I'm going to um, hand over to Joel to chair the next session. Thanks very much, Fiona. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Uh, my name is Joel Ree. Um, I'm from the discipline of general practice uh, at School of Population Health. So obviously, um, I've been working very closely with the centre, and um, I'd like to uh, thank you for inviting me to share this session, which is a great honour. Um, we've got three speakers today, and the forum theme is primary health care. I think that's very fitting um, given uh, Mark's um, talk earlier this morning. Um, and so I'm just reminded of um, the, the main principles of primary health care or primary care as outlined by Mark in his talk, which is talking about accessibility, um, coordination, comprehensiveness, continuity, and participation. So um, we've got uh, First speaker for today is Dr. Kathy O'Callaghan. And um, she'll be talking about virtual care with people experiencing homelessness. Our second speaker is Jane Taggart, who will be speaking about sharing e-care plans between GPs and health services. And We've got Dr. Catherine Spooner, who will be speaking about electronic shared care with mental health services consumers and GPs. Um, so each talk will last about 15 minutes, and then we'll have a few minutes at the end for Q&A session. And if you've got any questions, uh, feel free to put them into Slido as we go. That way, um, they won't be lost, because sometimes I've got these questions and I forget about them after a few minutes. So if you put them in Slido, then uh, we'll be able to um, uh, talk about that later. So thank you very much. Um, I think uh, we've got Dr. Cathy O'Callaghan first. Thank you. So um, uh, I'm from the Centre for Primary Health Care. I'm a research fellow. So I'm talking about um, a partnership project that we in the local health district. Um, okay. um, so the team at University um, Population and also RPA are uh, virtual. So as we've seen in the earlier presentation, um, the centre is uh, very committed to health equity and, um, and looking at health access needs, fitting the service to those health access needs and looking at better and fairer health care. So a lot of work we've been doing in the beginning of the centre um, is working in particular areas such as Miller, who's just been doing a survey, um, get very severe um, socioeconomic damage community. And um, looking at equity research, development, evaluation, and training. 
and promoting equity for all groups, especially those. Um, and part of that work is also working in partnership. Um, Follow the integrated care partnership. Uh, so homelessness in health, the definition of homelessness is uh, someone who the, the dwelling is inadequate um, for someone. Uh, it means that there's no space for social contact um, and um, people experiencing homelessness. It's not just, um, you know, people on the streets, it's people in boarding houses, it's tents. Um, and those conditions are in Cheering up the topic of Experiencing homelessness, also um, temporary lodgings, and there's no tenure. There's um, and living in other households. So it's yeah a range of of um, different situations. And homelessness is associated with um, and contributes to poor health because um, people who become homeless they've already been going through other um, conditions, um, mental health. Um, social conditions and so the state of health um, before, prior to being homeless uh, actually um, gets worse. And population have complex health needs in accessing, not just accessing health care, but receiving um, medical services as well. It's just as you can imagine, because there's no fixed address. Uh, lack of continuity of care that we were talking about, appropriateness, um, inconvenience of going to see a doctor, and low literacy, no support workers, none of that of um, homelessness, none of that social care that you have, and very fragmented, fragmented and also um, existing conditions as well, chronic conditions. So virtual healthcare, we saw um, change in our lives in 2020 with um, COVID, uh, with virtual the, the blossoming of um, virtual healthcare, which includes telehealth and it's uh, healthcare that's online or over the phone. And the model has been really successful in Australia and internationally, um, and has been used in uh, antenatal care paediatric mental health care fracture clinic, um, which I got the chance to experience once um, just last year, um, and um, medication symptom monitoring. So it's been really uh, successful. Um, and it has the potential to address equity barriers and reduce health equity. Um, and so what's happened was that um, we've seen a lot of literature about the equity or like who, who's using the service and in terms of access. And um, our centre was um, Bush, led the team, um, looking at virtual healthcare and health equity. And so um, there were some issues around equity um, of access in terms of culturally diverse groups, um, uh, not having caregivers involved, um, and those people severely, you know, socially disadvantaged groups not having access to uh, virtual health care and also digital literacy or having access to a connection and anything like that. So, of course, partnerships is, is important in that model. So, virtual health care for people experiencing homelessness. Um, but also, yeah, the review that we did. Um, also looked at um, RPA virtual, wanting to look at, you know, how um, services can be more accessible, how we can reach different population groups. 
So this is part of um, some of that work as well. Um, and yeah, telehealth is used less often with populations experiencing homelessness. So this was an initiative project in, in looking at um, reaching those populations in terms of access and continuity. Um, and virtual healthcare outreach is important, but can be challenging for the reasons I've said about you know, social distress, access to equipment, privacy, technology. Um, so this, uh, the project that we've embarked on um, is virtual, that, that we were building to work with, um, virtual health hub for people experiencing homelessness. And you can see in this diagram, um, the RPA Virtual Sydney Local Health District um, being the um, part of a multidisciplinary team. So there could be doctors, psychologists, um, nurses, other allied health um, come to a virtual health hub at um, places such as boarding houses, but um, Haymarket Centre is part of this partnership. And so the doctor or psychologist for allied health um, would be able to go into a room at Haymarket Centre. There is case managers working there and facilitating that access and setting up a patient. And there's a nurse from um, homeless health as part of the um, Sydney Local Health District facilitating that process. So this is a project that um, we've become involved in, centre has become involved with improving access to multidisciplinary support support, better engagement and more collaborative care, but also developing a cross-service framework for delivery. So setting this up and, and looking, evaluating a culturally safe manner for this particular population group. And committing to virtual hair, um, care sorry, and communication technology infrastructure. And of course, Sydney Local Health District has quite um, a large portion um, of people experiencing homelessness. Um, and, you know, we might see some of that. So in just another representation, it's hard to represent some of this work, but it's the people um, experiencing homelessness being able to come into a location that has privacy, that has Connectivity that doesn't cut out, um, and also all those support workers that need to be. To facilitate that. And so um, the Centre for Primary Health Care became involved in this through doing an evaluation. And so looking at all of those points of, of access, um, looking at accessibility and overcoming barriers, um, efficiency and cost effectiveness. So um, not looking at resource allocation and sort of cost benefit, you know, is it worth the effort, worth the, the resources, people's time. Um, and then also making sure that, um, you know, process evaluation, that there's the quality care, there's the technological infrastructure, connectivity, everything's there. And then also looking at um, patient outcomes. Um, but also in such a unique, this is what I'm talking about, is, is actually a pilot project, so it's early days. Um, but looking at stakeholder experiences, so we're going to be interviewing um, doctors, the um, psychologists, their, um, the case managers, and also RPA. Um, and then looking at outcome and impact. And it's a mixed method approach to analysis. Uh, so looking at literature review, stakeholder interviews with partners, but um, it's been a unique partnership in that there's ongoing evaluation occurring all the time in virtual healthcare. But um, we get access to the um, patient experience measures a data extract from the centre as part of that evaluation. Um, and that's been an interesting process in adapting those kind of evaluations. 
she measures after you about, you know, whether you get the, the care that you need, whether it's culturally appropriate, whether it's um, whether it meets needs and whether they treat people are treated with respect like all other people. And some of the challenges have been um, maintaining consistency in evaluation process. So a lot of um, thought and consideration went into um, having the evaluation and patient experience measures for any sort of care, but um, how that um, applies to a transient population that's in accommodation for two or three days. So um, people would get um, their experience measure on their phone maybe, or they, and then they lack connectivity, you know, to um, the data and stuff like that. So it's been quite difficult. And uh, virtual, making sure virtual healthcare is as good as face to face consultation, but at the same time, people uh, can't have access to face to face. Sometimes virtual is the only. And um, lack of data actually reduces the ability to access this model of care. So um, the importance of persevering and going through it. Some of this evaluation. And also um, the challenge is this is only a snapshot in time, so um, it's hard to do follow-up um, and patient measures six months on. Part of this pilot, but maybe later on. So results so far, um, it is early days, but um, you can see there was a rate, there's been a range of methods in trying to evaluate the program. So paper. Um, electronic use of tablets. And the good news is being really high confidence in filling out the premise. Some people are saying that the service is really appropriate, they're getting the needs that they, they want. Sometimes the needs are beyond a particular consultation, so it's hard to kind of work out um, uh, from some answers saying, you know, um, whether all your needs are met because it's such a complex situation people are in. Um, the need for mental health treatment is high, so that's about even with um, GP, being a GP. And, um, and then afterwards, expanding the service, um, you know, if, in terms of pilot moving on to other areas as well, such as volunteer centre, neighbourhood centres, community centres. And but just in conclusion, um, the talking about partnerships and working together. So um, I suppose the luxury of being part of the, the um, research centres within Sydney and being heard of um, working with um, RPA Virtual and the Arts Centre. And I don't know if you all know about RPA Virtual, that's like one of the, the um, one of three international like centres that are seeing the range of patients in virtual health. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. May. Thanks very much. Uh, next, we've got um, Jane Taggart, who will be speaking about sharing e-care plans between GPs and health services. Uh, I'm a research. Uh, We've been, I'm going to be talking about these uh, GP care plans, mostly focusing on cancer, but we are also doing work with um, It's been quite a complex and long journey uh, over the last few years in implementing this. Uh, I was uncertain what sort of image to put here, so I've asked AI uh, Dali for an image about shared care and um, supported with electronic care plans. So that's what came up. 
looks quite complex and that's been our experience. So just to talk a little bit about the journey that we've had. Uh, we've, we started with some qualitative work uh, looking at the, uh, the views of patients, specialists and GPs about having a shared care arrangement after their cancer treatment. We then followed up with some co-design and development in looking at a shared care um, arrangement and particularly looking at how information could be shared using a digital care plan. And from that, we then came, uh, we started implementing a feasibility study which we evaluated. Uh, and that's the main things I'm going to be talking about today. There's another couple of qualitative studies that have been done that relate to the feasibility study. Uh, and also we've now uh, implementing it within another study for breast and colorectal cancer, uh, which we've had quite a few challenges, which I'll uh, probably I'll sort of note later on when we get to that, uh, the challenges. And then also, as I said, we've gone into looking at uh, care plans and, uh, with clozapine shared care for people with severe uh, mental illness and also looking at physical health of uh, people living with a, uh, severe mental uh, conditions. All right, so why cancer shared care? Uh, there's been an increase in demand on cancer services. The, uh, incidence of cancers have increased slightly over time, but there's been a, a greater reduction in mortality rates um, over the five year uh, period. A lot more people are surviving cancer and that's put a, a demand on cancer services. Cancer follow up care and survivorship care is not optimal. It doesn't meet the diverse needs of patients uh, who require more comprehensive care. They need to uh, not just the uh, short and long-term impacts of cancer treatment, but there's also the lifestyle and psychosocial um, impacts as well that need to be treated. And then it's to also look at improved access to this care. So with the first, the qualitative study, this is just showing the views of what the patients, specialists and GPs thought about shared care and it was acceptable. it's acceptable to them. They believed that the GPs had a role in the holistic care and particularly that social, psychosocial care. And also uh, GPs needed to have a, a education and a greater knowledge about that cancer follow-up care. Uh, but also Patients in particular and GPs wanted the specialist to still be involved in that follow-up care uh, so, so that they'd have a role. All right, so what does that follow-up care look like? Uh, it's There's a cancer follow-up, so there's the surveillance of current cancers, screening for new cancers, managing the late and long-term side effects of treatment, and then the psychosocial lifestyle, other preventive care like immunisations and also medications. So these are all things that GPs currently do in primary health care. So why ear care plans? We wanted to have a dynamic care plan that information could be shared between the specialist and GP that would allow communication and also be able to monitor care uh, through the care coordinators. We wanted something that was dynamic rather than just a paper-based uh, um, care plan so that things could be tailored and changed or uh, as the patient needs changed as well. So we went on a process of co-design and uh, with the cancer services, with GPs, with consumers, uh, the local health district, uh, the primary health networks. Uh, we consulted with all the stakeholders. Uh, we developed a care pathway. We looked at what the care plan would 
uh, needed to include, and there were guidelines as Cancer Australia had uh, care plan templates. And we also looked at what were the options to be able to share uh, information and to share a care plan. Through that process, we had a lot of support through eHealth New South Wales. We um, had a workshop where we got some sort of consensus on what the care pathway was and what the options actually were. Actually, at the end of the workshop, we couldn't find really any options, so we needed to go away and, and look for other uh, ways of being able to share information and a care plan. And the tools we ended up coming up with was a, a GP uh, management, care plan management system that we could use to share that information. It syncs with the GP clinical systems, but it was something that the uh, cancer service would need to actually log into as well as the consumers to access it. So it was quite a long process just to get to get to the end of that. Uh, we produced an e-care plan pathway based on the fact that we were going to have a GP management plan. It meant that once the uh, patient had been assessed and agreed to shared care, we'd uh, install the uh, software at the practice and uh, give some brief training to the GP. The specialist would then have access to the care plan and tailor it, and from then the patient would then visit the GP and the GP would be able to share pathology results, uh, observations, notes, uh, and the uh, patient as well would have access to this. The care plan could be monitored uh, by the care coordinators and just follow up where uh, it was needed with the, the GP or the specialist. So they were sort of the in between the cancer service and primary health care. So this is what the care plan looks like. Um, it, text can all be edited. So you can edit the goals, the tasks, who's responsible for them, the frequency, uh, and also the top toolbar, there's a number of different functions. So the functions were that we could schedule tasks. So the, uh, there were tasks for the GP and tasks for the specialist. Information could be shared, pathology results and so on. And also the access um, to everyone within the care team as well as the patient. And it also, the system also provided notifications reminding people when appointments were due uh, and also um, tasks that needed to be completed. So these are uh, the findings of the colorectal cancer feasibility study. It was a small study. We had nine patients and their GPs in the uh, study. Uh, we qualitative interviews at baseline six months and at 12 months. These are some of the things that they told us. So patients reported a number of benefits. They valued having their GP involved in the care. It was convenient for them instead of having to go to the cancer service. The GP spoke the language, which their first language, and, and that was um, that we had two uh, call uh, patients, in, and this is something that they found was really valuable. Uh, they wanted their information shared. They were sick of going to um, different care people within a care team and having to tell their story. For GPs, is that they liked the idea of having teamwork. It was a new facet. They hadn't uh, been involved in uh, shared follow-up care because they hadn't been involved in the treatment of their patients, so it was something they were interested in. They had a long-term relationship with the patient, so they um, knew about all the other things that the patient required as well and what their needs were. And they were also reassured that the specialist would have access to the care plan and could we um, share and see the information. Specialists and the care coordinators thought that the care plan would be good because it'd be, and the shared care would be good because there's less focus on the non-acute, and they wanted the GPs to be involved 
uh, particularly in the lifestyle and psychosocial aspects of care, which they weren't doing. Um, there's, they liked it that there was a more structured uh, way of, of working with primary care. They had very little contact with GPs um, otherwise, and uh, they felt that it was clinically adequate and safe, and also they liked the idea that patients had access to the care plan. Okay, we were really interested in whether it increased information sharing and communication between the GP and the specialist in particular. Information was shared from by the GPs mainly because it was automated um, and it's synced with their clinical information system, so it was really easy for them to share information. They shared a whole range, as you can see. Um, the information was shared sometimes by the specialists, but there were some patients who had no uh, information that was shared or there was no knowledge that the specialist had even gone into the care plan to see um, their, uh, what had been happening with their appointments with the GP. And this was of concern to some of the patients who got quite anxious. Um, and there was one patient who shared information routinely. This was actually one of the called patients, but uh, had their son actually doing that for them. So having that, that was really important for the call uh, patients that they had someone who uh, could provide some sort of support, particularly with their uh, the English literacy. So did it support shared care? Um, the GP said that it helped them to manage uh, their patients. They, uh, by looking at the care plan, they knew what they had to do. Uh, they found the schedule was um, was useful and they also liked the notifications as well. The GPs found it quite easy to use. Some patients reported it was convenient and useful for knowing their schedule and sharing information uh, and they found the notifications and reminders helpful as well. Uh, but the specialists found it quite difficult and they, the main difficulties they had were actually putting it into their workflow and into practice. So you can see one specialist has said, I have to use multiple electronic systems and work out how to incorporate them into my workflow. So at that time they were using three within the cancer service and then the, the Inca care plan was a fourth. You can imagine them trying to remember <laughs> to actually look at the care plan. So the challenges, uh, the impact of COVID was a challenge on recruitment and particularly with the follow-up study, a quasi-experimental study with the breast and colorectal cancer, we've had real challenges in uh, recruiting uh, patients and also for their GPs. Uh, for the number, the percentage of GPs who were actually getting involved in shared care, it's about 40% of patients who agree to a shared care arrangement and into the study. Implementing at cancer service has been a, um, a real challenge. Uh, one problem is, is that the e-care plan is not integrated at all with any of their systems and the fact that they've already got three other systems in cancer services that aren't integrated is an issue. Uh, there's work being done at the moment by New South Wales Health with EPIC, which is looking at a single patient record. Uh, so I think it's they've got about 2,026, they're saying the first um, uh, area is going to have this implemented. I think that's quite a short period of time, <laughs> but we'll wait and see. Uh, and that may assist with systems like the one that we're, we've been trying to um, implement. Uh, limitations to access to the LHD systems. When we started, the uh, there weren't any policies that supported the actual sharing of information, information going outside the cancer service to primary health care. And we had to find workarounds um, to actually have any information being able to to be uh, sent or added to the care plan. There were difficulty changing routines, particularly after COVID, busy cancer care clinics, small number of patients, so they'd forget about accessing the care plan and access was infrequent. There was care coordinator turnover, 
they had other priorities and uh, there was another shared care project which they were working on. Uh, so that was a real issue as well with monitoring care. And also patient engagement. While patients access the care plan uh, maybe once, most of them didn't uh, access it for um, sort of routinely or uh, more than once. Uh, and they had said that they felt they didn't really need to. They knew what care they had to, they knew what their appointments were and so on. So implications for policy and practice. Innovate, uh, introducing and implementing innovations like a digital care plan is complex. Um, dealing with health services as well as uh, in primary health care. Uh, definitely need support to transition to shared care and to utilise technology. We need to facilitate access to information and communication between GPs and specialist services. It needs to be something that's easy to do. Um, it needs to, we need to have integration with clinical information systems and policies that support the sharing of information securely and safely. And there needs to be, uh, care coordinators need the time to be able to follow up and monitor care because it takes a lot of time following up with GPs. Uh, and they need to be involved more in the planning and ways to deal uh, with turnover because they were quite, uh, I think we, uh, there were about five care coordinators over the time of the study. And all of these things uh, impact on scalability. I'd just like to acknowledge uh, the people who are in it. Mark Harris is the uh, Chief Investigator, Melvin Chin and Winston Lowell, who were the uh, cancer specialists who've been involved at the start as well. This is, a, this is a few of the names. There are still other people who've been involved. Uh, the funders, we've had a number of different grants to do this work. Just some references and thanks. The Mark talk follows on really well from Mark's talk, um, which makes a lot of sense because Mark directs everything and everything we do is influenced by Mark. Uh, and it also uh, follows really well from James because we've um, been trialling the same Inca tool um, in a different space. So um, really glad, Jane, that you explained that so I don't have to do that. Uh, and again, we have the notion of a journey and I didn't realise that everybody was going to be having journeys and roads and, and trail tracks when uh, I prepared this, so sorry for the repetition, but there's a theme. Uh, and this is just a list of a lot of the people along the journey, but it's far from complete. I mean, I'd have to go down to about Bond 3 to put everybody, but uh, just to note that th there have been people on this journey from a lot of different organisations, including consumers. So just this talk, I'm just going to be talking Firstly, why has the centre been concerned with people with severe mental illness? And a bit about our journey so far. Um, what have we found and what have we learned so far? So why our concern? Um, the first dot point is really why our concern. Um, people with severe mental illness around the world are dying 15 to 20 years younger than the rest of the population. It's a huge equity issue. Um, they're having chronic diseases at younger ages, um, including obesity, diabetes. Do tell me if I'm on the wrong slide, by the way. Um, cardiovascular diseases and, and multi-morbidity. So they're complex conditions. And these are driven by modifiable risk factors. These are preventable. It's not suicide. It's not uh, fate accompli from mental illness. These are driven by preventable risk factors. Um, such as excessive alcohol consumption, physical inactivity and dietary risk. Uh, but 
On top of that, uh, people with severe mental illness often have medications with side effects such as um, weight gain. On top of that, people with severe mental illness uh, tend to have socioeconomic disadvantage, which, you know, from Mark's presentation and many others, you know, is directly and directly contributes to poor health of its own, as well as discrimination and other health risk. So, on top of that, people with severe mental illness have less access to preventive health care. So I don't mean less access to doctors per se, but less access to the sort of preventive health care that Mark was presenting earlier. Um, and less access to lifestyle interventions, so less money for um, gyms, let alone places that are appropriate for um, their condition. And primary care, as Mark outlined so well earlier on, you know, is about equitable person-centred care, and that's what this centre is all about. Um, Primary care is also considered the optimal setting for addressing um, and coordinating prevention and management of co complex conditions. So that's why we as a centre thought this was an important topic for us in this road. Um, so I'm going to just quickly go through our journey over the last few years since we realised this was an issue and then talk a little bit about what we're doing right now. So. The first thing we did, we got a, a small seeding grant from the Disability Innovation Institute at New South Wales Uni to do it. Uh, we, we had a lot of research on all the barriers and problems, as I just outlined, but we're thinking, well, what facilitates people with um, severe mental illness actually accessing a GP for preventive care? So we did some qualitative work um, and what we found in particular, uh, people were saying GPs who get it. So many said that, and, and a GP who gets it is a GP who can communicate appropriately, who ac can accommodate the needs of their patients with severe mental illness. It might be, um, you know, a separate waiting room, so they're not having to sit in, in a noisy wait room, maybe more flexible appointments, etc. Um, but GPs, I think, you know, looking forward, need support to be able to accommodate the needs of people with uh, lived experience of mental illness. But also the people we spoke to, they all had support people, whether it was carers or support workers or their mental health service. They need support to be able to uh, you know, access GPs, communicate with GPs, follow up. The next study was a, 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 an analysis of the Medicine Insight data, just checking you know, among, and this is GP patient records, so not population studies. So even looking at people with mental illness who are accessing GPs, um, you know, what are their um, physical health and um, demographic characteristics? And it confirmed, yes, you know, higher rates of morbidity, higher rates of, of, of risk factors. Um, so even um, among people who are accessing GPs. We also did some um, resource development for the New South Wales um, uh, Commission on Mental Health Commission. Thank you, Perry. Mine went blank. Uh, and Mark talked earlier about being responsive to the mental health, or to the health literacy of patients. Well, this was about services being responsive to the health literacy of people with um, mental health issues. And these are all online. Um, it's always good to have resources, but of course, um, resources need somebody on the ground. So having PHNs who uh, had somebody who was dedicated and, and, and supported within the PHN to be using the resources in a strategic way, of course, was very important. We also did a scoping review. So we looked earlier about what helps people with lived experience to access GPs. Well, by now we're sort of thinking about shared care and we asked, well, what helps GPs to engage in shared care? Um, and we might bore you with um, theories, but uh, there is something called relational coordination theory. I can speak to anyone who's interested. But the review outlined the importance of relational coordination um, in that 
people, you know, across the mental health service and GPs having shared goals. So this can, you know, working together because they both want the goal of improving the physical health of, of the consumers of the mental health service. Um, you know, mutual respect and, and a lot of problem solving communication, ongoing, timely, frequent communication. Um, and, and for this to be supported by organisational structures such as, um, you know, something so that um, information can be shared electronically. Also boundary spanners across the primary health service and the mental health service. So care coordinators have come up as very important. So uh, what we're working on at the moment, we have the one at the top there, co-design um, created tool for to assist communication between people with lived experience and GPs. That's a, um, we got funding for a Scientia scholar to do that and she's been working on that. I won't talk about that. And we have two trials um, to trial the use of INCA with mental health services. Uh, so one is um, with the Clozapine Clinic at South East Sydney LHD and Jane's leading that. Um, and I won't talk about that. But the other is looking at the physical health of people, um, consumers of the mental health service with Sydney LHD. So I will talk about that. And that's the um, shared project, shared health arrangements with research and development. Um, so we were looking at does INCA improve access to preventive care for the consumers of the mental health services in Sydney LHD? It's a pragmatic randomised trial with mixed methods. So pragmatic means, uh, as Ian Webster said earlier, it's in the real world. It's not a nice, neat little project with test tubes. Um, and mixed methods, qualitative, quantitative. And the setting is in an existing shared care program. So we thought this will be pretty simple. They've already got a shared care program. They've got shared care clinicians. Fantastic. This little tool will be, you know, just improve what they're doing already. Um, and you might note that the timing was post-COVID. Throw that in there. So the story I'm going to tell is, is a story of, of challenges. Uh, we aimed to recruit 500 consumers and their GPs. Um, we only managed to recruit 52 consumers and their GPs. So what I'm going to present now, uh, looking at the barriers to research, particularly to recruitment to the study, um, to the implementation of the intervention of INCA, um, and which barriers actually affected both. Um, and we're going to look at barriers for GPs being engaged, for the mental health service uh, clinicians being engaged, and for the consumers to be engaged. So firstly, looking at um, general practices and GPs. Uh, as I said, this was post-COVID. This was a time, as you all are aware, I think, the workforce was extremely stressed. Um, work capacity for taking anything on was extremely low. A lot of GPs just said, I'm up to here, I can't even take on anything extra. Um, but also, they often didn't have consumers who were engaged in long term. The consumers were often changing GPs, and they often didn't have a, a, a long standing relationship with the consumer we're calling about. And Jane mentioned that earlier about the importance of, the, of an existing relationship between the consumer and the GP. They're also concerned about software. Um, you know, some, you know, nobody's touching my computer, and I understand that. Um, and for some practices, particularly the large one, there needed to be a higher um, management level to approve installing software. So it could be a really long and um, process. Um, at the time, there was a um, the GPs were feeling really unappreciated um, with Medicare paying so little. Um, and so re remuneration, which normally isn't such an issue, was quite an issue at this time. And just for the intervention, there were some difficulties um, installing and using the software. So as you can see, most of the difficulties were uh, affected both the intervention and the research. Um, barriers for the mental health team, also their workforce was highly stressed. Um, there was limited capacity a lot of staff turnover, a lot of staff absentees at the time. So anybody that we um, talked to about the, the study or about INCA 
you know, they may not be there in, in the next month or six months. Um, there was some uh, scepticism about the value of research in general um, expressed, although that wasn't universal. That was just trying not to have an empty cell in the, in the table. Um, but specifically about the software, there was, again, some difficulties using the software, but also um, cons uh, lacking confidence in the ability to support GPs to use the software because they were having difficulties using the software and a little bit of concern about privacy that we had to work through. Barriers for consumers, um, there were barriers relating to the mental illness, um, cognitive capacity, failure to attend appointments, for example, um, and as I mentioned, a lack of engagement with GPs and ongoing relationship. Very minor, but there were some concerns about privacy or a lack of perceived benefit. I couldn't identify anything that really um, impacted just the research or just the intervention. These sort of things affected both. So to summarise, um, you know, largely the barriers were around workforce issues, software issues and consumer issues. But they mostly influenced both the research and the implementation of the intervention. So we had a uh, we, we had dozens of uh, changes to the protocol and dozens of um, amendments to ethics. So uh, one thing was we extended the time for recruitment and intervention from three months to ten months. Um, we increased the reimbursement for GPs. We provided additional support to GPs um, to install and use the software, additional to what we thought we would need. Um, we got the big guns out. We got Mark Harris and the head of the Mental Health Service of uh, Sydney Local Health District, uh, Andrew Knight, to go personally to GP practices and talk to the, um, the practices about what the study involved and the value, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that's really senior level research assistance. Uh, we did, uh, you, know, t you know, we kept retraining the mental health service clinicians because they kept turning over. And I do want to emphasise working with the mental health service shared care clinicians constantly was absolutely essential um, in advising what we do and supporting what we do. These are the PHN funded uh, shared care clinicians, by the way. Natalie. <laughs> so the impact of, of dealing with these challenges, the recruitment period was increased, but that meant we've had to decrease the follow-up period. Um, and it's the, the smaller numbers, we've reduced study power, there's a whole lot of uh, outcomes that we were going to look at that we just didn't have the power for, but also um, with the follow-up period being reduced, there are a whole lot of outcomes that we couldn't expect change to occur, so we had to stop, you know, not, not even measure them, you know, such as change in diabetes risk. Um, and we extended the timeline by a year with the same budget, so you can imagine the difficulty of that. And this is when we're spending a lot of unplanned time making changes, negotiating those changes, talking to people in the field, talking, um, you know, lots of meetings, changes to ethics, you know, a lot of additional time burden. Research team, um, and I must say too, the shared care clinicians, I should have put that in there, um, were, you know, almost yeah, burnt out, but we've also had quite a bit of turnover but just because of the sheer length of time, let alone how difficult it's been. So, what what's our lesson from that um, sorry story? Well, one is that you know, we thought the pilot work had been done in the cancer space and that we could, you know, we're just trialling something, you know, simple in an existing service that's, you know, already doing shared care. Um, but clearly pilot work still needed to be done with a different context, with a different population and with a different uh, series of events post-COVID. Um, I think point two, we always try to do too much with too little. Um, because, you know, we have to promise a lot for the funding bodies and we're just so keen. Uh, we have to try and water ourselves down every now and then. I think we need a watering can in the reception area of the centre um, to try to be a bit more modest with our goals and our timelines and our budgets. Um, because this is complex intervention research. 
it's uh, 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 yeah, it's not as simple you know, as seeing if you give somebody a tablet, will will their you know health improve? Um, and we need to include clinicians, and we do include clinicians. The shared care coordinators were absolutely crucial in this, but GPs are increasingly difficult to engage in research. And this is a real question for us as a centre and um, anybody else doing similar work. How can we address this? Um, and, and not just even saying yes to participating in a survey, but being engaged in research and advising our research. So in conclusion, last road for the day. Um, our intervention research, sorry, message from my son, we're expecting a baby back on my screen. Um, our, our intervention research has difficulty in a complex system that is under a lot of stress. Um, and Mark mentioned that earlier, um, but particularly post-COVID. Um, the limitations of our health system constrain what we can do. So while we thought something was simple, um, where the health system is not able to operate at 100% um, of what it aims to do, um, you know, we can't always fix that. And most importantly, no one study will answer all the um, questions. So you know, that's why we're talking about a journey. There's a, um, each study we do, we learn something a little bit different, but nothing is going to tell us all we need to do to achieve equitable um, improved health. So CPHCE is in with the long journey, um, and we're hoping that a lot of people in this room or listening to this uh, presentation um, are willing to join us. Okay, thank you. Thanks, thanks very much, uh, Catherine. Um, we've got a few minutes for Q and A, so um, I'd like to invite uh, our three uh, presenters, so Kathy, uh, Jane, and Catherine, if you're happy to come up to the front uh, for some Q and A. Um, and thank you very much, everybody, for uh, putting in those questions through Slido. Um, it's uh, actually come up really nicely, so very excited. Um, I was just, uh, my nightmare was there'll be no questions and I think of questions, but clearly not. Um, so I've got a uh, first question for um, Kathy. So what is the difference between virtual care telehealth and telemedicine? Maybe you can come up and use the microphone. Yeah, yeah. So virtual test. So um, difference between um, virtual care includes telehealth. So telehealth is using telephone. <laughs> what was the other? Well, virtual care telehealth. Um. Yeah, virtual virtual health includes any sort of online. Um, it includes telehealth. Virtual. Uh, I don't. Yeah. Um, That's right. Um, yeah. Got a follow up question to that. So, um, mm. prem and prom. Mm -hmm. So, what prem measure did you use in the uh, project? And also, for in terms of proms, are you uh, accessing that data. So with the PREMS, we have adjusted the, the usual PREMS with people um, accessing virtual care. So um, patient experience in terms of um, accessing um, quality of care if people have an existing GP um, and whether it was respectful and also following up with um, if there's um, virtual if there's hospital in the home treatment as well. So that was quite unique to the population. With the PROMS, we have looked at um, different measures um, of using PROMS. So PROMS is um, patient reported outcome measures. And with this population group, it wasn't, um, we thought it wasn't appropriate. We're still looking into it. And the closest model for PROMS would be um, ED to community um, measures, but 
um, it's using a patient portal and it hasn't been um, that successful um, in previous. So I think we're still looking into it, but with a transient population, it is quite difficult to do those outcome measures, which are like you know, a couple of months after or six weeks after. Other studies have done that um, internationally and um, and probably you know future projects as well. Thank you. If there's anyone else who wants to explain, but which virtual care and everything, but I think a lot of our virtual people are on a virtual yeah. um, online. So um, yeah, and um, I guess there's a G. I guess as a GP, one of the things we learned about is the definition of telephone versus telehealth yeah, consultation, yeah. isn't it? Which was defined as we went along. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I've got a question here for Jane. So can you tell us a bit more about the co-design process with consumers? Co-design process. Uh -huh. um. What we um, did was we had individual consultations with a range of um, consumers as well as um, the specialists and GPs. That was so many years ago, <laughs> it's difficult to remember how much, but we involved also consumers in um, providing uh, their feedback on the care plan template that we developed. Um, as well as the care pathway and how that would, um, you know, how that fits in as, as well. Uh, so they were involved in those consultations and the workshop, and we've also involved them in the steering committees uh, that we've had over the course of the project. We've always had at least one consumer involved uh, who's given um, input into what we're actually doing within the study over time. Thanks very much, uh, Jane. Um, and uh, Catherine, um, if you were repeating the study now, uh, what what would you do differently in terms of improving recruitment? Is this working? Yep. So good question. Um, I would really, if funding allowed, and, and even at the time, you know, we did want to do a, a small pilot um, of the Inca. Um, at the mental health service before launching into a large trial. But to be honest, you have to go with what the funding will fund. So, you know, uh, I think if we had the funding, I would have liked to have done a really small trial. Uh, and again, I'd also like more GP involvement in the development we had, but getting GPs involved is also very difficult. So a lot of the lessons that we're sharing, uh, we they're not completely a surprise to us, um, but we did want to share some of these problems with you as an audience because uh, just to understand actually how difficult it is to do research in the real world. We, we all know that you need to start small, co-design, um, you know, have this program of research, but you know, we're reliant on funding bodies, what they will fund, um, let alone pandemics don't really help. Thanks very much, uh, Catherine. Um, so I'd like to thank all our speakers for speaking today and thank you very much for your time and um, for answering those questions. Um, so a lot of people have sent in uh, questions through Slido and um, I deliberately withheld many so that we can actually address them in the panel discussion, which is coming up now. So I'd like to um, invite uh, and introduce uh, Professor Michael Kidd to come up um, to chair the panel commentary and plenary session. Um, so Professor Kidd, um, I think everyone knows who uh, who he is, but he's the Director of Future Health Systems at UNSW and uh, past president of Wonka, uh, two times past president of RACUP. I can continue, but, <laughs> um, but uh, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Kidd. Thank you very much.